Okay, everyone, this is the week or section on Foucault. Um, you should have, we just finished the, um, what's it called? The second writing assignment, the choose your own sociology assignment. If you have questions or need to submit late, please let me know. Um, not choose your own sociology, choose your own theorist assignment. Um, you know, things are, it's that side of the semester where we're all a little brain dead. Um, so for Foucault, you, he is notoriously difficult to read. And I know some people mentioned that um, Bourdieu is by far the hardest so far. Foucault would have been even harder. So that's why we are reading a summary of Foucault rather than Foucault himself. Um, in a way, the reason why Foucault wrote um, in such a twisty, turny way is because of the way he understands power as a function of language and discourse. And so if the way that academics typically write and um, discuss topics is a form of power, if he wanted to disrupt that power, he would also need to disrupt the way he wrote and explain the concepts. So. Um, that is another reason why he is a little bit, he's not as like, um, formulaic as we read in Weber and Durkheim. Um, he is very much, he tries to give 50 different ways to, to write a certain thing. So you can think about how it might be applying in different contexts, which is frustrating for people who just want a straight definition, right? Just tell me what power means. <laughs> but then he gives us like eight different, you know, ways of thinking about power. So um, recognize that it's not you misunderstanding Foucault when you read all of those different ways of defining concepts. It's simply, it's Foucault being intentional about forcing us to think about these concepts in different ways and in different, um, uh, applying them to different circumstances. But let's get started. Um, so just real quickly, Foucault was a French philosopher so he was not a t sociologist. His biggest influence come from Hegel, Marx, and Nietzsche. Um, early on in his life, Freud and Heidegger also were big impacts on him. All of those are, um, besides Freud, are big in German philosophy. Um, Freud was, as many of us know, was a uh, psychoanalyst who really started the field of um, thinking how we can talk or how past experience affect present selves. And Foucault actually wanted to become a psychologist at one point. Um, he got his bachelor's in psychology, um, but then started being interested in how psychology itself was full of um, power dynamics that were representative of the larger social sphere. So some of his big insights that we'll read about, you will, this is an old slide, we will not read about biopower. Um, unfortunately, it's a really important concept that has a lot of, has spurned a lot of future uh, debate and research. Instead, we'll be talking a lot about disciplinary power in this class. Um, I'll be bringing up knowledge power. Um, and then we'll also be looking at how um, power is multifaceted and inherently imbued with resistance. Um, just so we, we should um, recognize the problems of every person we study, both theoretically and in their lives. Um, Foucault has often been criticized for thinking ethnocentrically and ignoring minority positions. A lot of feminist scholars and um, Africanist scholars have brought this up and tried to reform Foucault um, in a way that addresses minority positions, um, especially when he says that um, power is equally um, resistant and um, enforcing. And people are like, no, there's definitely imbalances of power. Power is not equally distributed. Um, he also initially thought AIDS was fake. 
um, which was intriguing because he ended up passing away from AIDS. Um, he was very much involved in the homosexual community. I think he would reject any labeling, but he had sexual relations with men. Towards the end of his career, he was in San Francisco doing um, research with the gay community um, and was sexually active there during the AIDS crisis, ended up contracting the disease and passing away from AIDS. Um, there's also reports of pedophilia. I haven't looked into the reports specifically, but he was one of many French philosophers at the time who advocated for uh, removing the age restriction on sexual relationships between adults and children, arguing that children, um, I, I don't know if he had like a certain age limit, but saying that young people and young, um, younger people, as in children, did have consent and could give consent. Um, and so that was a very controversial position, but he was not alone. N not saying that is okay, but I'm just saying that it, he was not a lone figure, um, but one of a, a few prominent French philosophers who were pushing for a um, reconsideration of age of consent laws in in France. So I just want to note those um, and uh, Professor. Yeah. What what were what were his mul multiple issues with mental health? Oh, all over the place. So he was often um, especially at the beginning of his career was institutionalized for um, episodes. I am not sure off the top of my head exactly which ones those were. Um, but he did, he was institutionalized for a bit. Um, some people theorize, or I guess theorize is the wrong term. Some people um, wonder if the reason he was so focused on the history of psychology and psychiatry was because of his own, um, uh, I guess the current term would be battle with um, mental health. Um, we will see, and I think this is a really interesting and intriguing line of thought, how he he disrupts the notion that mental health is the opposite of sanity, um, or like mental illness as the opposite of sanity. Um, and so I, I, I'm not quite sure off the top of my head which mental health issues he had, but... Um, mm -hmm. It, it, it's interesting to look at how he talked about madness when considering that he did um, have severe mental health concerns. So um, through this, we're going to go through and talk about the following power resistance, power knowledge, dis disciplinary power and disciplinary society. And we're going to start by talking about the theory or the method by which um, Foucault worked to uncover power in society, and that is what he called archaeology. So archaeology was kind of a mix between philosophy, social science, and historical methods. Um, in Downing's book, she wrote that it was a history unconcerned with individual experience or human agency, and instead was an inquiry to uncover the system of rules underlying statements. Um, and what she means by statements is um, you'll often see in other writings of Foucault or talking about Foucault as discourse. So you can switch out statements in Downing's quote to be discourses. And he saw discourses as a way of speaking that emerges and transforms the world. So it is a power of action of bringing things into being. And when we look at theories like social construction of reality, which some of you may have um, talked with me about in, uh, or in other classes, um, sociology very much um, has accepted the idea that through social interactions, we create the meanings of the social world such that reality itself is structured by the way our society talks about the world, right? 
Um, so for example, um, in since the 1980s, um, we have kind of the majority of American society has accepted that capitalism is the best way to go about organizing an economy um, such that it is you become almost a pariah in American culture and politics if you advocate for something else, if you advocate for communism, if you advocate for socialism, or even if you advocate for more regulation. Um, it has become such a pervasive belief in American society that most Democrats are afraid of speaking to that and rejecting the notion of capitalism as the prime method of controlling the economy. Um, and so the way that over time society in America has evolved has created the reality that, that capitalism is the way, right? Is the best way forward. Um, and it has, cre it has, defined our social policies. It has defined our philosophies about what it means to be human, about how we are all individualistic, selfish creatures, and that is the best way to govern a market, that we should have less regulation, government should be out of, the, out of things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this um, single idea has constructed our realities of what it means to be human, what is society, and how we should go about. Um, this for Foucault would be a discourse, a way of defining the world, a way of speaking that emerges and transforms the world, and such it is a power. That discourse is a power of bringing things into being and shaping the reality in which we live. Any questions? Okay. Not yet. So... That's, that's how he does a study. What, so he's not looking at necessarily, um, he, he, this is kind of a rejection of Weber in a lot of ways. Weber was very concerned about the individual experience and the individual meaning, whereas Foucault is very unconcerned with how individuals go throughout this space and instead is very interested in how um, power relations are bringing into being via discourse different um, societal systems and structures. He is looking more um, at an interactional macro level of society um, and is focused on following the ways in which rules and discourses evolve over time rather than how individuals function within a certain time period. Um, so wait, Professor, I do have a question now. Yeah. So I looked up the word archaeology because, you know, I got to understand the words. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it is not what is here. Right. So, <laughs> so why did, why did um, Foucault think he could change the definition? That is a great not... question. I am not sure why he chose archaeology versus something else. Um, that might be in the intro portion of Downing's book. I did not okay. assign that or review it for this. I'd have to go back um, and see exactly why. Um, I will. Okay. I will write that down and I'll try to. I'll send out a note of why. Foucault chose. It's just that I have to throw the definition of archaeology because I, at first I thought, when I read this, I thought, oh, I thought archaeology was something else. And I looked else. it up. <laughs> and, else. You are, yeah. And you are so, it, <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to make sure that I was putting in my head how he's seeing it because now, when I think about the word I can see arc, like for me, I, that's like a, I can see discourse in the word arc. Right. Let, let me just say that. I can see that. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what etymology is thinking of. So I will go forth and figure that out for you um, and let you know. Um, but you do have to kind of, at least for now, dispense the idea of, you know, digging up dinosaurs and instead think about he wasn't doing that he was not doing is that. what i'm saying he was not doing that not okay 
Okay. <laughs> so as he was going, he um, as he was philosophizing, might we say, and doing this archaeology, he realized we need a new explanation of power that the ones he had weren't working. And we can see, let's go back through some of the ones that we've looked at so far. Um, so Marx viewed power as kind of one-dimensional from class oppressors versus the oppressed. Um, du Bois expanded this to look at different um, social positions, race, class, and gender, specifically how class created race relations um, and uh, exploited race relations. Du Bois also gave a little bit more onto the I idea of how resistance is possible um, in talking about how the um, double consciousness and the veil provided marginalized folks with better understanding of the social world. Uh, Weber, um, his definition of power was the ability to make people do things um, that they otherwise wouldn't. Um, we specifically looked at the types of legitimate domination as conceptions of power. And Bourdieu, power is really vague in that it is the ability to use capital in your field to gr build more capital um, and attain a higher or more desirable position within that field, right? So it's the use of power to gain more power or use, use of capital to gain more capital and um, a higher position in the field. Um, for Well, yes. Well, Professor, what if I, I understand Bordeaux's definition of power here, but power depends on the capital needed in the field and the capital you possess. But I don't know that you would necessarily use the capital to move up. I, I, I think what I'm trying to say is you can have power even in the position that you're in and to the world it may look like you're in a lower position but because of this capital that you have you might be in a bigger position or like a better position than you think because you have a lot of capital even though you might be in a lower position necessarily you he know what i mean you would take that into account right so even if it's someone who doesn't have the social recognition of the influence they wield, that influence is still there and is a power they have accumulated by virtue of the things they've done in the field. So even if it's not recognized that they have achieved a higher position, they still have because they have achieved greater influence. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. um, he's not necessarily saying you have to be recognized as growing in the field, um, but that you, you have any influence you have gained or any capital you have gained does put you higher in kind of the, that field space. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so let's look at how um, Foucault changes this a little bit. Um, he wrote, the way in which the power is the way in which the conduct of individuals of gr or groups might be directed. So in a way, this reminds us of Weber, right? It is... Um, the ability to make people do things they otherwise wouldn't. Interestingly, Foucault doesn't um, put power in a person, right? So for Weber, power isn't a person. It is the ability of someone to make someone else do something they wouldn't. For Foucault, power is something more vague and describes the way in which the conduct of individuals or groups might be directed. It doesn't necessarily have a single person doing the power, right? It just is a way to direct conduct. Um, in the second quote, power is modes of actions more or less considered a cal calculated, meaning they might not be calculated at all, um, which were destined to act upon the possibilities of action of other people. So it is an action that acts upon what other possibilities people have to act. And we're going to get into other definitions of Foucault, too, um, for power. So I just for, for right now, I just want you to see how power is not imbued in any person. And it is kind of this free flowing 
way that governs how people act, okay? So specifically, power is not a group of institutions that ensure subservience to the state. That would be something Weber would say. It is not a mode of subjugation that rules over a population. It is not a general system of domination and it's not given by the sovereignty of the state, law, or other institutions. So what is it? Here are some of the other ways in which he describes power. It's a multiplicity of force relations imminent in the sphere in which they operate and which constitute their own organizations. Remember, multiplicity of force relations is how Bourdieu talked about power. Imminent in the sphere in which they operate and which constitute their own organizations. So power themselves are the organization. So a multiplicity of force relations which constitute their own organization. Foucault very much sees the social world as power, as a competition, as um, how people pulling on strings of power in some way or another. The support these force relations find in one another form a chain or a system. So um, we'll get into next week. This is very similar to how Collins sees power that these force relations are intertwined and support one another. But they also are enmeshed in the disjunctions and contradictions that isolate them. <laughs> so remember how I said that Foucault talks in circles and has a lot of different ways of speaking of it. Here we see that he's saying that power is two contradictory things. On the one hand, power is not only the force relations themselves, but they're also the support that the force relations have because they're all enmeshed together. But that's also the disjunctions and contradictions that isolate force or power. So power is not only power, how power supports power, or how power isolates power. <laughs> the, so he's trying to really say that power is everything. Anything that is moving throughout the world that is influencing us is a form of power. So the strategies whose general design becomes embodied in the state apparatus, the formulation of law, and in social hegemonies. So what he's saying here is that the strategies to wield power become embodied in the social structures that we have. Um, that doesn't mean that they um, have formed a specific way of exerting dominance, which is something that Weber, Marx, and Du Bois would see. But instead, they become the, they are able to dictate when and where resistance can even occur, right? So we will talk about how power necessitates Every power relation includes resistance, and thus it's not that the state apparatus has more power, it's, it's that the state apparatus decides where the resistance can come from. So we'll see that in a second um, when we talk about sexuality. But in essence, power comes from everywhere, and it goes everywhere, and it does everything. Um, I'm going to read you a quote um, from another piece. This is Foucault's words. Um, you can get the um, actual text of this quote when I upload the PowerPoint. It's in the notes. He said, there is no binary and all-encompassing opposition between the rulers and the ruled at the root of power relations and serving as a general matrix. There is no duality extending from the top down and reacting on more and more limited groups to the very depths of the social body. So this is very much a rejection of Marx, um, that there's no top-down power. Um, there's no binary between the oppressors and the oppressed. He says, these form a general line of force that traverse the local oppositions, link them together. To be sure, they also bring about, so power brings about redistributions, realignments, homogenizations, 
serial arrangements, and convergences of force relations. Every use of power rearranges the power relations that are that are occurring in the world, redistributes them, changes them, um, and he says that major dominations are the hegemonic effects that are sustained by all these confrontations. So, um, it major dominations in that they exist are simply the um, the consequences of all these power relations coming into contrast with each other and bumping up each, into each other. And then sometimes they create a, um, a, a major domination like the state apparatus, like the law um, that we see wielded by some people. Um, however, power also has a purpose or a logic. And this is where, um, uh, what's it called? Discourse comes in. Discourse is power, um, it, it, but it has a purpose and logic. So he writes, the rationality of power is characterized by tactics that are often quite explicit at the restricted level, tactics which, becoming connected to one another, attracting, propagating one another, and by forming comprehensive systems. So we could think of systems like um, sexism, systems like uh, charity, systems like capitalism, like America, at a singular um, thread of power, the logic of that power is very obvious and, and well explicit. But as it becomes connected to all these other different strands and eventually creates this system, the logic becomes kind of muddled. And it's hard to understand what is going on unless, for Foucault, the um, scholar teases each strand bit by bit. And that is what archaeology is doing, is identifying these strands of power that collectively make up these gigantic comprehensive systems that seem like nothing, that seem like they are just naturally there. And instead, he's saying, no, we can pull apart strands that make up these systems and show how each of these strands are power relations. Um, as an example, this is something I um, did in my research at young adult centers. Um, there was um, a, just, again, there's a lot going on in homeless centers, um, a lot of different kinds of power strands. They seem like, oh, this is just how you help people who are homeless. But as I was there, I realized there was this power strand um, of the of adultism that was in within the organization that was unspoken logic, um, and they used it in pretty terrible ways. But they thought they were doing things that were good. So the logic was simultaneously: you are not old enough to be responsible for your decisions because you're a young adult, but you're also not old enough to make your own decisions. And so <laughs> they wouldn't allow these young adults to have um, agency over their own lives, yet then they judged you based on your maturity and independence and whether or not you seemed adult enough. And so you could only show maturity and independence by accepting dependence on the homeless shelter so you had to accept all of their rules. You had to accept all of their consequences. Even that, that even though that is um, giving up independence to show that you are mature. So um, I talk about how in the homeless center space, dependence on the homeless organization is seen as independence. And independence, being able to take charge of one's own self, is seen as immaturity. That's not... You know, it's not like in the homeless um, center's uh, manual. It doesn't say they must show depend or independence by being dependent on us. And if they show any signs of independence, it is immaturity. <laughs> that's not what they wrote, but that's the logic that was working out there. And I had to tease that strand out of all the power relations going on in the homeless center. Um, does that I make a little bit of sense? I, I think that 
that example pairs well with this angry black woman mantra. Because I'm thinking, well, <laughs> there are lots of things I ought to be angry about. Right. Why are you telling me not to be angry? <laughs> you know, it seems crazy <laughs> in some ways that you would ask people to to experience or or witness or whatever the case might be horrific things yet but don't be angry about that right and so (laughs) what what um foucault would be interested in is okay let's take what's happening now this idea that black women shouldn't be angry um let's find where that began and how that is a power how that is um not only a, and we'll get to this in the next slide, how this is not only a way to suppress black women, but also produces the form of redis- resistance for black women. Mm-hmm. That, you know what, I'm going to be angry and you're going to sit down and listen, right? <laughs> so mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so he, he sees where there is power, there is resistance. So this is why on every um, one of these arrows, it's going both ways. Mm -hmm. He writes, where there is power, there is resistance, and yet, or rather consequently, this resistance is never in a position of exteriority to power. It's never outside of power. Anytime you are engaging in resistance, you are exerting power in just in a different way. So he writes, and again, I am sorry, it is jumbled, it is Foucault. (laughs) He writes, Power relationships existence depends on multiple points of resistance. These play the role of adversary, of target, of support, or handle in power relations. These points of resistance are present everywhere in a power network. There's a plurality of resistance then, resistances, each of them a specific case. Resistances that are possible, resistances that are necessary, resistances that are improbable, Resistances that are spontaneous, savage, solitary, concerted, rampant, violent, compromising, interested, sacrificial, etc. By definition, though, each of these resistances can only exist in the strategic field of power relations. They are inscribed in relations of power as irreducible opposites. So each, he's saying that any kind of power relation has an infinite possibility and existence of different ways of resistance because every relation of power has its irreducible opposite that's always coming against. Um, This is where one of the critiques of feminism comes in because the way he writes it makes it seem as though every power relation has an equal and opposite relation. And a a lot, I mean, they're saying that's not true. You know, it's not that... um, men exerted power, but women exerted resistance in equal measure, clearly there was, throughout history, there has been an imbalance of that power. And Foucault never is really able to describe why there's that imbalance when he has this idea that every power relation has its resistance. But Professor, does does Foucault or any theorist for that matter take into consideration that particularly when you're talking about gender power, mm-hmm. uh, I think I think there may be more power. I think sometimes women may have more power than than has been discussed. That's probably true in a lot of ways. Um, I am not a ge- a power gender scholar. <laughs> Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Um, I do know that every year or so someone will come up and, or, and show, um, here is this unknown way that women exerted influence in 1600s France, you know? Um, so it's commonly coming up and perhaps, you know, in the end of all of that, Foucault will be seen to be right. Um, it is hard to imagine with things like slavery that, you could say there was an equal, um, equally powerful resistance, right? That's not to say they were weaker or that they um, were 
didn't care as much. It's just that there was an imbalance of power, right? Um, and so it's hard to square equal power and resistance when there are in the world these imbalances. Does that make sense? It does. I, I'm trying very hard not to hold up the presentation because I have so many questions. <laughs> I know you do. Um, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so for now, just know that for Foucault, where there is power, resistance is right there as part of it. There's no way to get around it. Um, here is where we get into kind of the interesting thing that I think if there is an idea that people have grasped onto and agreed with, part of, it's largely in here. So again, when we talk of discourse um, as a way of speaking that brings things into being, in another way of, of, of terming this power is called power knowledge. He either writes this as power dash knowledge or power slash knowledge or knowledge slash power or knowledge dash power because he sees power and knowledge as the exact same thing, right? If you're able to define something, you have power over it. You have created and made that thing into an object and thus you have power. Thus power is knowledge and knowledge is power, um, et cetera. And we're going to talk about how um, through the ability to name and define things, we have created our world. So he gives a lot of examples in this. Power knowledge creates and constructs by naming and defining objects. Um, the first one you have read about is madman and um, madness. The second one that you'll read about is criminal. And um, the third one you'll read about is homosexual. Um, but we could see about this in a lot of ways. And he uses all of these different, he, as examples throughout, is that when you say you are a madman, you have created that object of being a madman and you have power over it. However... Remember, with every power comes resistance. So by defining something as madman, you've created a potential avenue for resistance at the same time. So let's see how this works. I think the easiest example is um, it, homosexuality. Okay, this is the one. So power knowledge is both freeing and restrictive. It is freeing and creative in that it provides a subject. So in defining and naming homosexuality, um, people, the, the power relations that be, created the subject of homosexuals who could then use that framework to claim rights, to claim privileges, to claim an identity, to claim a, a, a meaning for inclusion in society, right? Um, so before uh, there was the creation, okay, I should go back. Before the Victorian era, there was no homosexual. There was no idea that sexuality defined a person, right? It was people engaged in homosexual acts. And it wasn't until after the Victorian era, specifically a science, like modern science became, that they started see, they started like identifying and naming different people based on their sexuality. So um, this person engages in homosexual acts 75% of the time, thus he is a homosexual. This person only engages in homosexual acts 45% um, of the time, thus she is bisexual. This person never engages in homosexual acts, right? So it's, it's, creating a category of person based on their sexuality. And this did not occur before. It was just, this is so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so has a proclivity towards men, right? That was how any form of sexuality was discussed, but it was never in terms of identity. So on one hand, 
creating that identity cre um, allowed people to define themselves that like I am, you know, it, it gave them the power to name a movement, right? I'm born this way, leave me, I, I should get rights. It allowed them a political status. But on the other hand, it's restrictive and disciplinary. So it is objectifying. By defining what homosexual is, there is now a normal homosexuality. So even though we as a American society often have described homosexuality as abnormal, as heterosexuality as the norm, homosexuality as the abnormal, what Foucault is saying is when we say that something is homosexual, it now has norms and we can now control, measure, approve any idea of homosexuality. And you see this in a lot of ways still today when people say, oh, they're not gay enough. That is one way to pol uh, police is a strong, uh, but like provide social control on one's sexuality. And uh, for example, this happened to me when I joined a gay Mormon group while I was in college and we had to go around and everyone say two things that they like to do or something. Um, in a group of about 10 people, every single one of them said at least musicals, music theater, dancing or singing, some kind of, you know, um, musical type activity. My two were playing soccer and going hiking. And right after I said that, everyone laughed and was like, are you even gay? Right. So there was this idea that I didn't fit the norm, even though the idea of homosexuality was supposed to be abnormal. <laughs> so mm -hmm. who, how was I not homosexual when actually, because I was abnormal to the homosexuals, I was the most homosexual one there, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was the abnormal mm -hmm. of the abnormals. But mm -hmm. by creating an object, it reduces that object to its definition. And while that definition might be contested, there is still now a sense of what it should be and that we should control it, that we should measure it, that we should approve it or reject it, right? Um, so power knowledge creates subjects, which is freeing, but it also restricts them to objects, which subjects them to discipline. Does that make sense how something can be freeing and constricting at the same time? Yes, but I I have to say this. So this is this is probably the closest I've seen to the argument that I make all the time around language and how it is used to describe black people mm -hmm. and how we live and how we think and you know whatever it is that the words are right. uh that are used uh against us and I see it as against us anyway. But so when I look at this, what he's saying, I certainly can see it. I could just say, instead of homosexuality, I could say the construction of the black race is now a thing that can be regulated, controlled, measured, approved, rejected, jailed, et cetera. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, I could just switch the word. Is it's what it looks like to me. Is Kanye no longer black because he supported Donald Trump, right? Is right. Did he give mm -hmm. up his privilege of being in the black community or mm -hmm. um, right? So mm -hmm. similarly to, you know, any black Republican um, or someone who um, we could think of someone who like a uh, Bill Cosby who said, um, well, uh, these young black men need to pull up their pants and stop being in gangs. Right. So like, mm -hmm. How black is he? That's a, that is a contested category now, even though um, on one hand, society will say, well, it's biological. But on the other hand, they'll say, well, you're not black enough or you're being too black or, you know, <laughs> you're that mm -hmm. that hair is too is too much. You know, you should straighten it rather than let mm -hmm. it grow. So it's all you're right in that even blackness is being contested. Um, well, some might like you hear a lot within the last 20, 30 years of people reclaiming their blackness and being proud of who they are by, and call, like, I am proud to be a black person while at the same time, you're hearing these contestations of what that means to be black and whether mm -hmm. or not someone is the appropriate amount of black. Right. 
So this is very much, you're, you're right on target that um, all of these categories and words and language that we use is imbued with power. Um, another example that I think shocks a lot of people, um, but maybe it won't if you've been working in the, um, the space of, organis- like of workplaces for a while is sexual harassment. Um, so yes, we know that unwanted sexual advances have always been happening. Um, read any work of fiction <laughs> and I almost can guarantee you there's some form of sexual harassment in that work of fiction. Um, but it's not always been named. And so in the U.S., sexual harassment became part of the legal doctrine and employment law. So it was, it was um, brought into the Civil Rights Act in 1975 as part of the employment law. Um, so it, part, it was labeled sex discrimination, um, and women finally had a way to get resor- recourse for sexual harassment because it was now in the law. I have a way to sue someone for um, harassing me, even if they did not necessarily assault me or harm me, right? Um, The problem is, once sexual harassment was defined in the law, you had to prove one of two things, either that sexual harassment was quid pro quo or that it created a hostile environment. Those are the only two ways that you can prove sex discrimination or sexual harassment in the workplace. There is no other, it, it has to fit those definitions and compensation can only come monet- in a monetary fashion, right? You, there's The way the law is set up only provides a, you know, a monetary, um, you know, maybe $10,000 for pain and suffering um, because of a hostile environment. There's no other, you can't, you know, say, I want this organization to restructure itself to implement sex discrimination, you know, policies and things like this. Um, Compensation is rooted in monetary um, gifts once you've proven these two um, uh, requirements. And this currently um, is being really uh, litigated and um, a lot of blowback right now. against sexual harassment claims by anti-feminist activists because they're saying, how is this quid pro quo or how is this a hostile environment? Because they're using the definitions against those experiences. Um, So how could it be different? So in other countries like France, sexual harassment is not a employment law, it's a criminal offense. Any t- even if it happens in the workplace, you don't file a civil discrimination lawsuit. You file a criminal offense lawsuit, and the offender can go to prison, whereas sexual harassment is not an imprisoned, imprisonable offense. <laughs> it's only a fine. Um, so this changes the whole notion of what sexual harassment can be, and this has become a super important part of... Um, online spaces because if sexual harassment in the u.s is based only in the workplace can you claim sexual harassment online but in france because sexual harassment is a criminal offense anywhere it happens you can claim it as a crime um so while on one hand providing the legal terms of sexual harassment gave victims both the language for claiming a subject as I have been so, I've been sexually harassed. I know other people, and a means for seeking recourse. It also provided a definition and a constraint on what sexual harassment can be. Um, if you're interested, I have a link on the bottom of this slide. Um, what is sexual harassment? Um, by Abigail Segui. I think that's how you pronounce her name, who is the one who came up with showing how we created sexual harassment as a legal doctrine. Okay, so let's look at how it happened with madness. So um, I have some quotes from the Downing book. These are all Downing books. Pre-modernity, madness was often seen as um, not madness as in they're crazy, 
but in a different form of sanity. Um, the sanity or it wasn't even sanity. There was more of a spectrum by which people were dealing with the absurdity of the world, right? It, there was this idea that the world was a mystery, we'll never be able to understand. Some people try to understand it with religion. Some people try to understand it with science. Some people try to understand it with politics. But some people just defy reason altogether. But that is their way of trying to um, under, trying to relate to the absurdity of the world, right? So uh, Downing writes that pre-modernity madness was an ironic form of special reason. It was um, kind of like they were pilgrims in search of their reason and by extension, the reason of the world. Or, but like specifically that madness had a relationship with sanity. It was an alternative way of dealing with the absurdity of the world rather than opposite sanity. But with modernity and with this, um, with the scientific obsession to name and define and to categorize, scientists created an opposition between madness and sanity. There was a binary system with sanity being healthy and madness being sick. And so madness was viewed now as a civic problem impinging on the financial and like social stability of a nation. And it became seen as kind of, you know, with a lot of other categories of the time, it became the binary between, you know, uh, respectable humanness and animalness. So madness was the person giving into their passions rather than being governed by reason. Um, this is also when you see the diagnosis of hysteria coming up for women, that a lot of women would be placed in asylums because they were seen as mad by being too emotional or by being um, angry or by not, um, if they weren't submitting to their husband enough, then they would be seen as mad that they weren't, you know, being reasonable and would be put into institutions. So um, I'm not going to read through all of this, but he's suggesting in the, the idea of creating the madman that um, on, we, have, I, we have idolized scientific reason to assume that it liberates us from um, the crazy world and religious superstition and absurdities. Um, and instead, it has simply redefined that absurdity and given itself an instrument as an instrument of power and control. So instead of really answering the issue of absurdity, science has said, I'm going to control the world. I am going to be in, in power by naming all of these different things that happen and regulating them based on whether or not they fit those definitions. Um, and so through this process, humans are being created as both subjects, remember, both free and objects constrained by science. What are your thoughts? What questions or confusions do you have there? I think I probably need to say what I want to say off, off <laughs> recording. <laughs> I, I'm writing it down. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, no, that's good. So it, it, it's... Um, it's, it's important. It's, it's, man, it would, it's fascinating. Um, it's really hard to teach Foucault because he more than anyone else, I would argue, draws on philosophy in such an important way that it's hard to understand him without it. Um, this is all, if you've ever read Nietzsche, um, this is all imbued in Nietzsche in that we have created systems to grapple with the meaninglessness of the world. Nietzsche believes that um, life has no meaning. <laughs> He's saying we can't, there is no meaning to life in Nietzsche's view. Um, he, he argues that you have some people on one hand, like um, Buddhism, that tries to deal with this meaninglessness and suffering by giving up desire. 
So there's this idea of finding Zen by releasing all attachments to the world and finding um, peace in not having any connections and not suffering. Um, then you see, on the other hand, you have uh, religions and science which seek to control the suffering by, oh, well, that's because you sinned, or, well, that's because of gravity, or that's, be right, creating these ideas and definitions to name and control the world. And Nietzsche is saying, y'all, the world is just absurd. <laughs> there, is no, there is no rhyme or reason to any of this. Um, and so Foucault is borrowing on that quite a bit. You see that um, uh, when he's talking about the madman as a, a, a version of laying bare the nonsense of the world or relating to the world an absurdity that's really drawing heavily from Nietzsche. And it, so it's really hard to understand him without seeing that he's not coming up with this idea out of nowhere, <laughs> right? He's building on a lot of philosophy that's already um, discussed this to some extent, okay? So we're gonna move on from creating subjects and objects through knowledge power and talk about another form of power which he calls disciplinary power. So this is a um, discourse of, remember that special term discourse, of, um, of prisons, of um, convicts, of captives, of criminals, right? This is the discourse of how we've come to this moment in incarceration and criminality. So... He opens up his book, um, Discipline and Punish, with a really graphic scene of torture um, in which someone is draw drawn and quartered. Um, those who un are unfamiliar with quartering, it's when they would tie each um, limb to a horse and then have the horses move in different directions until you were literally pulled into four pieces. Um, and so he described torture was a specific... Um, act that was public so it was um it was supposed to be a spectacle to remind the public of the sovereign's power specifically the king or the queen and it they put the crime specifically on the body of the convict so if you stole you would get your hand cut off if you um uh, and we still do this today actually treason you got your head cut off, right? Because it was so obscene to defy the crown, to defy the sovereign. But each of these was a public event to instill the fear and the um, obedience into the public. So this feels like lynching to me. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, that's what it feels like. What what I'm looking at and what what I'm reading. That's exactly what I think was at play. I mean, whiteness was the sovereign power at right. that time, right? So, yeah. I am going to see if anyone's written on that, um, because I I haven't thought about that. But yes, um, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so that's interesting you say that because he sees that uh, he sees a evolution of power into new forms, but he argues that none of these forms are fully evolved, that you always will have torture. You always will have the next couple forms we talk about. Um, and so you see torture in, um, in like, uh, What's it called? Guantanamo Bay had a big torture stuff. The, the difference is that's not public. So how is it being used? And it's used in new ways. So he sees the second evolution of power in, in convicts as punishment. So this is semi-public. It's a um, revenge of the crime is put on the convicts' actions. So they're put to work, um, which is still a form of their body. And it is... Uh, it, you see a shift between um, the uh, reification of the sovereign's power to what we're going to talk about as discipline, right? As a retraining of the person. And so that's 
what we see in this um, final constitution of power. Sorry, my dog was killing the battery um, <laughs> line. Um, and so discipline is private. It is not you know, we put them away into a different area. We don't put them on display. Um, you can't see who is watching you. He described the panopticon, which is this picture on the right, um, where there is a single watchtower in the middle. And often the glass was one way seeable glass. So you could never tell if you were, if the person in the watchtower was watching you or not. Um, so you know you might be being watched, but you might not be. So you instead, you discipline yourself in case you're being watched, right? Rather than... It feels that's, that's what, to me, that's what living behind the veil is like. Mm. That's what this is to me. That's interesting. Another good... Um, I don't. I I would be shocked if anyone has really grappled with Dubois and Foucault at the same time. Um, mostly people who grapple. Sounds like what I might have to do. <laughs> most people Foucault and I are getting along. <laughs> most people grapple with uh, Dubois and Marx. Um, so that's another one I'll look up to see if anyone's done. Um, so, I'm 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 in the middle of reading the Dubois and Marx one. Yeah. 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 So the um, we saw that the torture was put up put the revenge of crime on the body in punishment. It was put on actions and for discipline. It's put on the mind or the soul. It's really trying to um, control one's mind and and soul. Um, and it's omnipresent. The idea of discipline is that it's everywhere um, and that it's um, affects and, and what he's going to say, Foucault, is that it's, it affects all of us. This is a new way of doing power in society, even beyond the panopticon or the prison. And we'll talk about that in a second. But So, so Professor, can I just ask you this real quickly? You know how in my uh, research we keep talking about accountability and social control? Mm -hmm. um, so it would seem to me that Foucault is saying that's exactly what white males need. So here's, a, unfortunately, I think that Foucault would bristle at any kind of um, normative use of his ideas. Um, <laughs> Foucault was... Um, he wouldn't want it to be used to, to, to normalize behavior? Well, he would just say, well, that's just another power relation that's going to affect people and just going to change things. And what good is it really going to do? He was kind of a nihilist in that, in that way. Um, okay. So he actually, um, he was recruited by communist and socialist parties fairly often because he was critical of the status quo. And every time he would meet with them, he would just be like, what you're doing is just creating new ways of power. And this really doesn't change anything. It's just going to shift who's in power and the structures of power. And I don't like he was very kind of like, man, what it <laughs> so mm -hmm. he I don't know if he would say, oh, we just need a new way of regulating. He would just say, well, that's just a new way of power that's going to create similar problems just in different ways. Um, so that I, I'd have to think about that a little bit more, but my gut is that he's not the one who's going to give you the right answer on that. He's not going to. He's not going to be very helpful. Um, okay, well we'll see. I'm thinking <laughs> you can still. Okay, you can prove me wrong. You can be like, hey, but it works in this way. Um, so Foucault argues that even though there has been an evolution from torture to punishment to discipline. Torture and punishment still exist today. We still have capital punishment in a lot of the world, even in the U.S. We have monetary punishment. Um, prisons still work for low wages or no wages, so there's still prison labor. Um, there might not be, you know, large public spectacles, of, but there's still, you know, when they do death by lethal injection, they still put it on display that people can come and watch. Um, 
his big point, though, is that discipline has somehow extended beyond prisons, where torture and punishment still largely exist within the legal apparatus. Discipline is something that has breached the prison walls, and we are all imbued and are subservient to discipline in some way. Um, so what he says, this is the way to exercise disciplinary power. And remember, he's saying that no one person can like wield this power, but it's a power that is at force within society. So he's saying, first, you have to give name. So this is the power knowledge. You have to give name to a type of person and a category of person. You have to normalize what that person is. So what are the normal behaviors? What are the normal thoughts? What are the normal beliefs? You somehow create a way to ubiquitously watch them or at least be able to tune in on them at any given time. And then people will, because they never know when they're being watched, discipline themselves to be normal, to adopt that normal belief. So, for example, in healthcare, we have the category of person as the patient. We have created the normal actions and thoughts of a healthy, a healthy lifestyle in which we expect the patient to um, adopt. We have different tools of health monitoring, whether that's your checkup where they see every little thing that you've you know, what your heart rate, your blood pressure, your, I don't know, your pulse. But we also have things like the heart monitors or the Fitbits or the Apple Watch health thing. Um, people can upload their data. Um, and then people discipline themselves. They change who they are to fit this normal idea of a patient. They go on diets. They go on, they do exercises. They go on fads, you know. Uh, they'll have surgery, whatever it is. They'll go to the doctor and say, I have this problem, fix me, right? So people themselves are disciplining their own health because of the category of patient that we have created with the normal actions and thoughts of a healthy lifestyle. Another way, another example is the student we have the student. This is a type of person. We have categorized the right type of student, the normal student who is an honest learner. We ubiquitously watch them by giving them assessments. We can give them pop quizzes, um, uh, essays at any time. And so they're always, you know, even now I could say, hey, John Z, how do you define knowledge power? And you're suddenly being watched, you know? Um, and so students now discipline themselves. They study, they go home and they research, they go home and they work at it. They might find a tutor. Um, that wasn't necessarily the thing you had to do um, before modern education. A lot of times pre-modern education, a, a, I mean, part of this was because it was only wealthy people who could afford it, was you would hire a tutor who would come and teach your student or your, your, your son or your daughter or whoever. Um, but there wasn't necessarily this idea that you have to go study. Instead, it was the tutor's job to instill that knowledge into the person. And if the student wasn't learning, then it was the tutor's fault. Whereas today, if you're not learning, it's the student's fault for not learning because you weren't disciplined enough, you weren't trying hard enough, you weren't, right? So again, we've created a, a category of person that is now disciplined. I think everyone will relate to the workplace. <laughs> so we have a worker that is a type of person. We want good workers. Um, we're seeing today a critique of millennials, of Gen Z, because they are not, they don't have the work ethic of the boomers, of the Generation X. They, they are too needy. They expect more. Um, we have created a ubiquitous watch we have, um, you have to write reports. Your managers write reports on you. Amazon has created a system where colleagues write reports on each other. Um, you have uh, computer monitoring systems that watch what you're doing on your computer um, or your internet or 
um, you've got cameras. Um, and then there's this discipline then that you're not, you don't waste time when you're on the clock, that you are watching, you're making sure you're doing it, um, that you even might work overtime a little bit because you want to be seen as the good working hard employee, even though you're not getting paid for it. Um, so it's created, again, the idea is that we discipline ourselves because the power relations in society have created a category of person with a normal ideal. We've created the idea that we're watching what you do in that respect. And so you discipline yourselves rather than the state or the company coming through and beating you or whipping you to get you into shape. Um, the last example here is the citizens of a nation. Um, in America, kind of the ideal normal citizen is an, is an employed patriot, right? You both have to be working and you have to be unequivocally in love with America. <laughs> and that if you find any critique, then you are a commie, you know? Um, and we have a ubiquitous watch. Um, we have police cameras everywhere in Chicago, it feels like. Um, but you have police patrols who are going through, and you never know when there's going to be a patrol car. You never know if you're on the highway, if you're going to pass a highway patrolman. Um, welfare has you do regular check-ins if you're on welfare, because you, by being in welfare, you are abnormal, and you need to be controlled. And so you are put on a regular watch. Um, and throughout, we are always disciplining ourselves to be that right citizen, right? We are there... <laughs> Almost everyone today defines employment as a good, as something that is um, important and helpful and moral, even though that, why? <laughs> why? Right? We, why can't someone be engaged in productive causes for the better good without being employed by a corporation, right? Um, but that is because of the way we've constructed citizens in America, that is how it is, as employed patriots. Um, and so we discipline ourselves to make sure we are like that. And I mean, why do you think you have such anxiety when your job term is coming up or you need to switch jobs? Part of it, yes, is having employment and having money. Um, but even wealthy people feel anxiety if they have like a five-year nest egg they can rely on. They feel anxious when they are unemployed because they are not being good. They are not a good citizen. They are breaking the rules. <laughs> and so they're disciplining themselves to frantically go and find work. And, you know, um, so we live in a disciplinary society. The panopticon is not just in the criminal systems, but it's on Facebook. It's in our classrooms. It's at the workplace. We've, here's a picture of the Chicago Police Department. Or no, that's the New York Police Department cameras. Um, it's in our health apps. So the idea is that we, any time you are adopting an identity or a category, you are adopting a, um, a, a power relation in which you are being um, judged according to whether or not you're fitting the standards of that power relation whether it's your race, your class, your gender, your whether you're a student, a worker, a, a citizen, a, um, a member of the um, bird watching club, right? Each time you do this, you're accepting a power relation and you start disciplining yourself to be the best and ideal normal that it could be. And he, he does mention that if you go too far, you know, like, if you're too patriotic, then you'll still feel the control to move back into the normal range. So it's not that there's the best patriot that we're all achieving, but we're trying to find the normal patriot or the normal, the normal good worker, not the brown noser suck ass, right? <laughs> or the normal good student, not the, um, the geek or the nerd or the loner or the dumb student, right? You want that normal good student who's right, you know. Anyways, that's the end of the, of the, of the show, so I'm happy to take your questions, um, and I will stop the recording as well.